we're going to try and keep this a nice and informal session. Um, uh, first of all, I, uh, I'd like to introduce our distinguished panel here to you all. Um, first, uh, ladies first, Helen Beresford. Um, Helen is the head of uh, ID at uh, Shepard Robson, um, uh, 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 as you all know, an award-winning design group. Um, She's developed a, a lot of knowledge in the activity-driven uh, design approach to, to the projects you do. Um, so we're delighted, Helen, that you're with us today. Thank you. Um, Tom, if, if I, <laughs> I, I, yeah, Tom has such a long CV, it's difficult to, uh, to, to, to abridge it for you. But um, Tom uh, started studying his furniture design at, at Nottingham Univ uh, University, was that? Or the Polytechnic? Polytechnic. The Trent. Ah, right, okay. Uh, and then uh, went on to do an MA in industrial design at the Royal College um, of Art. Uh, he uh, had an interesting start to his career where he worked with Daniel file at Pentagram, um, and then uh, prior to, uh, that was just prior to co-founding Pearson Lloyd, uh, the practice that you know he co-founded with, uh, with, with, with Luke. Yeah. So, there we go, that's Tom. Uh, and Mark, last but not least, Mark Gabatas. Mark um, was born in Yorkshire, apparently, according to his CV here, and came to the world of furniture design in a slightly circuitous way, uh, having started his working life in, in advertising. Uh, before changing a career path to train as a cabinet maker. Um, he uh, apprenticed, which is always a good thing to see, at uh, Codrington Furniture, and then Stemmer and Sharp, um, which was in the uh, acclaimed oblique uh, workshops in Hackney. And it was then in Hackney that he set up his own studio, Gabitas Studio, and then moved it latterly to, to West London and out to Oxfordshire, where you are now. So welcome to you, Mark. I don't think we could have asked for a better panel uh, of experts to talk about this thorny subject. And that subject is British design, who rates it? Now, you could interpret that in a number of different ways, um, and we'll, we'll explore all of those ways to, uh, to, to, to debate it today. So just initially to get us going, um, history and global context. I, I have one sort of broad question. Uh, what is quintessentially British about uh, British design that, say, distinguishes it from German or Scandinavian or Italian design, do you think? I can go to any one of you. Shall I start? Why not, Tom? Yeah. yeah. Um, funnily enough, when I was at the RCA in uh, about 25 years ago, uh, Helen uh, Penny Spark did a lecture on why uh, the design that comes out of different countries is a an expression of the personality of that country, and um, whether it's a, the Scandinavian connection, deep connection to sort of nature because of the the dark and the light and the the craft that comes out of that place. Um, Britain has its own heritage, and I think it's it's very important to understand the kind of I think the sort of geopolitical position of Britain from a colonial empire that looked out to the world and brought back things, brought back culture, brought back materials, brought back people, um, and also its relationship and in an Anglo-Saxon way out to North America and into Europe, and I think that's quite appropriate in terms of Brexit, where we're not quite Europeans and we're not quite, uh, we're not quite in the Atlantic, so to speak, but we speak both languages, and I think there's a all those things are, are important sort of context in understanding why and how we, we um, end up the way we are. Um, I don't know whether I've answered your question, but that's a sort of yes, as no, a starting I think you have, point. Yes, yes, very much. But yes, Mark. Yeah. Well, he, here's the thing. I mean, I, I, I have um, a sort of a, a take on this, which is slightly different because I didn't have any training like, Luke, um, like, uh, like Tom did. So um, when I started the studio in, or when I started working in furniture when I was 30 years old, which was kind of in the 19, early 1990s, it seemed to me that there was an extraordinary, um, there was a real edge and a real feel and a real identity to British furniture design. And, I'm, and we're talking mainly about furniture. And I, and I remember kind of looking up, um, thinking, looking at people like Michael Marriott and um, Jasper Morrison and um, Tom Dixon and Matthew Hilton and thinking that there was a real um, cohesiveness in the irreverence that was almost the hallmark of British design at that time and that's what um, um, was kind of going on at the same time as 
as, as my background as a designer maker. In that time, in the 1990s, we were chucking out the chintz, IKEA was happening, Habitat was happening, and suddenly England was becoming exposed to contemporary design, whatever, that, whatever we thought that meant. And there was this extraordinary flourishing of British creativity in, furn in furniture. And I think that that's kind of, and I think, to be honest, I think that's kind of dissipated over the years. And now I think um, of really the handful, and you can probably count these people on two hands of British furniture designers who are working abroad um, for international companies. And I think to myself, I mean, Tom and myself included in that, why are those companies coming to us? Is it, is it because we are British? Or um, is it actually because we happen to have an interesting perspective, which is altogether a different thing, on the British market. And I think it's more of the latter. And if um, we happen to work with some of the biggest UK brands, and therefore, by definition, we have this insight into the UK market. And I think, in, in a sense, people are not paying us anymore for our unique UK Creativity. I think people are paying us for our insights and, uh, and, and, to a certain extent, our, ability, our, our internationalism. So, sorry, that's me going off on one, but that's kind of how I feel about it. So, does, if, if I would attempt to sum it up, it's about our understanding the local need better than the more global aspects of that need. I, I guess it prompts a, another question, unless you wanted to answer that particularly I was as it going was. To, so, I was yeah. going to pick up, because it does remind me of, um, I, I was also an RCA student, and I can remember Penny now, <laughs> um, and um, I remember talking about tribes and um, tribalism and how the UK and England and Britain and Celts are, are, have, are a particular tribe and we are very good at also collecting friends from around the world and that probably is part of the sort of colonialism but we're really good at being magpies for bringing in and adapting um, interesting things that we make our own even fish and chips aren't English they were an import and yet we now see them as quintessentially sort of English so um, and I think probably London is, is, has, has a particular interest nationalism to it but I still think localism is really interesting whilst um, some of the world goes international because I think people do still like that quirky English British thing and maybe we're a bit too understated as ever about our skill set I was lucky enough to um, bounce up and down as a small child on an Eames chair and um, on Robin Day furniture because my parents, for their wedding presents, um, had all um, day furniture. And, and a few years ago, we had a sort of museum, uh, v &A came over and, and, and they did an exhibition. They, they brought, took some of the furniture and put it in an exhibition and said, you must wrap this up in, in, in cling film and not use it. And we were like, well, we've recovered it several times because we used the furniture and it was great and practical, slightly industrial and, and incredibly exciting because Festival of Bristol Times sort of brought some amazing, interesting ideas. I think there's no reason why British shouldn't push out and be prouder of that slightly eclectic quirkiness because I think a lot of our clients and I, I have a slightly different perspective from, from you guys who are wonderful makers because um, as an architect we often specify and make um, and quite a lot of the, um, the values that some of our um, corporate clients are, are trying, to, trying to engender is something much more characterful, personal human well and uh, you know uh, British is a fine thing to celebrate in that context text so uh, I'm going to jump about a bit because it sort of really plays to another question here which was um, perhaps there was a golden age of design um, and and w what do you think could be done now with design disciplines we have materials that we have whatever to create a new golden age of British design if you're pointing to the likes of Robin Day they were certainly driven by new materials at that time uh, which have, you know, gave you that industrial feel you're looking for. But do, do you feel there's something we can be doing now to be encouraging a whole new, a new golden age? Can I borrow that? I think the issue is that we don't have, we don't have the brands. It, there is, we have, and um, Tom, was, Tom was saying this yesterday, we have an extraordinary um, wealth and variety of small companies not you know one to ten employees who are designer making or batch making who um, have a, a great aesthetic and a great um, uh, marketing presence but then 
between there's a massive gap between, between um, those organizations and the larger brands. So whereas in Italy you have, I think, you have a, a plethora of brands of manufacturers uh, um, who are kind of the, the one to five million pound turnover, and who have a very good marketing presence again, and you go to the Milan Furniture Fair and it's full of them. We simply do not have that layer of, of, of industry, which means that a lot of those designers who are, who are great coming out of university and may cut their, um, cut their uh, what do they cut initially? Well, um, cut, um, cut their cloth, um, make, um, designer making, then they have nowhere to progress to. And I think that that's a, that, so the golden age of design depends upon giving of the, the existence of brands, being able to give these people an, um, an opportunity to design, in my view. I'm, I'm going to disagree. I think it's not up to manufacturing to create that, that, that age, that golden age. I don't think we should even be sentimental about something that went in the past. I think it's depressing to imagine that it was better. The, you know, the 50s and 60s was a particular moment in culture in terms of materiality after the war. There was a whole... We can't imagine that Eames... You know, if only Eames, you know, if only Robin Day. I think we've, we've got to park that personally. I, and I, I, unfortunately, I think it's up to designers to go out and look for and make their way. I don't think we can expect manufacturing to be um, the providers of that golden age. It's true to say that we've lost a great deal of our industrial base in this country, but we've always been a, a nation of shopkeepers in that, the cliched sense. And... You know, Formula One, and there's so much about the, there's an inventiveness about British design and engineering that it almost perpetuates that small scale. And I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, I think it's, we often get, we do a lot of work in Germany, and we're often told that um, the Germans will employ us because they don't want to employ Italians, because they, they, they're too scared of the kind of the romance and the poetry. There's not, quite enough, there's not quite enough rationalism for a German mm. psychology because Italians never had an industrial design education history. It was always architects who did furniture design. Yeah. But we have a liberal arts tradition which make us very different to, for example, a German design heritage. And I really don't believe that um, it's based on a need of local knowledge, a local market. I, I think we've got an ex extraordinary, unique take on the world to export. And I, I, I don't believe it's, it's based on just their buying a skill set in, in, in for the UK market. I think, I think we need to... I think we're understated again, because I think... Um, I, I still love the fact that I grew up with the heritage of, um, of um, Robin Day as normal. My, all my friends would come round and think well, how weird I was, because I also lived in a broyer-looking house that my dad was an architect, so I'm afraid it's in the DNA and diseased. But, um, you know, we had a flat-roofed flat house that ended up, you know, being iconic. I think we had blur around to do film shoots in there. When I was younger, though, it was considered just odd and weird as a house with these strange bits of furniture with bits of metal in. To me, it was totally normal. But what I see now is an absolute opportunity not to throw that out, but to build on that sort of interesting heritage. And there is a bit of industrialism there, but there's also a bit of chic there. And I think we just need to galvanize um, that creativity that we have innately and, and the quirkiness. I kept thinking when you were saying, Tom, that quirky is often what we are we d we're not obsessed with beauty like a lot of, like the Italians are far t far too beautiful for, for the British you know why is the DM iconic for, for, for the UK because we're, we're a little bit odd we're not afraid to be different and um, we can make things that orig are original in our sort of search to specify things that suit our clients when they're wanting not just the corporate norm that's bland and grey, they're wanting characterful things. We've just, we just finished a building down the road, 245 Hammersmith, um, and we, in the reception there, we have a client I've worked with for 20 years who loves design. He spent more time with me showing him designers of furniture and taking him to British product and arts and crafts type product as well as industrial product and because he wanted the story to be authentically 
British and to have a real good feeling of uh, in terms of design. And there weren't just British products, but there were definitely some good quality British products in there. And I think there's a huge. I think there is a bit of renaissance happening already with some of the some of our ex-RCA colleagues, like um, uh, the very good and proper's that have come out of people like coexistence. I think there are an awful lot of really great talent, um, and what we need is more of it. I think the, the I think the other thing that is happening is to to see what's what's happening in the design world beyond where well built bi well buildings are important where people want sustainability you know those are perfect opportunities for our clients to say um, go British buy British and be be proud of it but not just for the sake of it because it is really better than it's 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 international it's European counterparts so I think I think designers need to just get up and do it because the opportunity is there yeah, I quite agree. Um, it sort of begs a question uh, as we look to uh, having just passed through uh, London Fashion Week and everything else. So the fashion industry is perhaps a cue for this. You, you're talking about the importance of brands, Tom. You're refuting that, and you're talking about quirky. Um, I think you could probably say that those are all cues that are uh, that the fashion industry is taking. Are there some lessons that we could learn from the fashion industry in promoting British design, British designers? I mean, it's all. It's British designers who are leading the leading fashion houses at the moment. So clearly, there very, is an acknowledgement of true. our capabilities. Yeah. I think I think the fashion industry um, punches well above its um, its weight. And I, um, for me, I think um, I mean what, one of the reasons I got out of, got out of advertising was precisely because I, I felt it was a very meretricious occupation, and I I really liked the idea of um, doing something that had a little bit more integrity. Um, and God forbid the idea that furniture is going to be sold like fashion because the implication of that is that we start to throw out our furniture season after season because it's the wrong color. Um, and somehow that whole sense of, um, of, 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 uh, uh, of the short life and the short time period of the relevance of a particular product is anathema, is, it seems to me. And that somehow the, we should be concentrating as, a, as the furniture industry as being having the most um, sensible source of sustainability is the idea of buying something for life. So those two things are fundamentally um, opposed. And the idea of us launching a new collection twice a year because we want people to throw out the purple stuff and buy green is, is appalling. What, what I do find interesting is why, of course, the, furniture, the fashion industry gets so much PR. So it, you know, London Fashion Week, front page of the Telegraph, um, London, London Design Festival, we don't get a column inch. Um, and so for somehow, it seems to me that historically there's, we have a, um, a, a much different relationship with fashion than we do with furniture. And I think it goes back to that, that fashion historically had, was something that was an elite um, interest and it was always patronized and encouraged and designed primarily for the elite. And furniture um, never really um, had that um, to the same extent of patronage, I sense. So for me, I'm... I'm it would be lovely to have the same amount of um, support at ground, at grassroots level, but I, I fear if we become like the fashion industry. I would, I would, I would differ because I think there's a lot to learn from fashion industry, and we do work with a number of fashion houses, um, and I think it's the reverse. I think um, sort of furniture is actually an incredibly middle class um, kind of. Um, uh, aspiration you know your designer beautiful furniture you're spending thousands of pounds on that's handcrafted is a real elitist um situation whereas you know people like ikea probably did did sort of break that mold you know contemporary design was more um democratized but i mean what's happening in some of the fashion houses and and we work with burberry for example and 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 um christopher bailey did a huge job to turn around and make fashion more in haute couture more accessible to the point where the tribes in east london kind of actually took on board you know uh, Burberry scarves as being their kind of edgy, you know, brand, brand, brand situation. And in fact, he ended up mocking himself, sort of, um, at the end of the, his career by, by, you know, um, you know, bringing out, you know, what that edgy, edgy Burberry um, check. So I think, I think fashion is really good at having a conversation with a broader group of people, and they've actually embraced digital to create digital communities to get people well into something that's very exciting and sexy and appealing, but also something that can last 
fast because I think whilst there is the throwaway fashion and there's the more swift fashion, there's also people like Stella McCartney that are having um, that are sitting there saying, "Well, let's have vegan vegan clothing and reuse clothing." So I think that the things that are affecting our culture, you know, dress is hugely important to us and it's a wonderful thing, but it's also a tribal thing. It expresses something tribal and everybody can have it. You know, I think what we need to do in furniture is not be so exclusive. We need to go out there and tell people why they want to have an investment piece that, that lasts their lifetime and, and, and save up for it. Uh, and at the moment, I don't think as an industry we do that well enough. Tom, do you want to add anything to that or I can open it up? Uh, I could. But it might take a while. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think we shouldn't... Because the, the life cycle of fashion and furniture differs, I, I think we, it doesn't mean we can't learn from the processes. So I think it, it is, I don't think anyone's pr proposing that we buy furniture every year, because none of us could afford to, and I think that no one would be interested in doing that. I do, I do think there's a slight problem in this country that we're based, because we're still a, based on a, um, a landed aristocratic and royal patronage, the aspiration is often not to a contemporary life. It's often to a Tudor. If you win the, ro the lottery, you, you get, you're more likely to go and aspire to an antique. And I think that's a serious part, that we, because we'd never had a, a revolution in 1780 or whatever it was, that's one of the reasons why we don't buy contemporary furniture. And I'm not even joking. Um, no, I, 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 I think there's a not. kind of cultural, there's a cultural sort of weight that our, that our weird uh, history sort of lands over aspiration and, o and over the elite, which but I think is a mistake. I don't think you always have to own it. The big difference now is you can't necessarily afford to have a mortgage anymore. I look at my parents who, who, who were completely into design, so I sort of have a, have a I am spoiled, and they, they had a, a, an oak tree fell down and they made that, they got, a, they got a maker to make them a beautiful table. We won't be able to take that table on board because we won't have houses that are big enough. But where will that sort of furniture go? What you, I think, increasingly people demand their coffee shops to have something more beautiful in them that aren't just a piece of throwaway furniture. You know, our offices, we're now designing offices with library tables. I think we've just, we've just um, put in a 20-person table in 245 um, Hammersmith with, um, by, by Benchmark and some wonderful Mark furniture in, in, in that same location that are really lovely contemporary and investment pieces that are more corporately bought but so you and I can go and sit there having a coffee and use those pieces of furniture so I think if we get a bit more civic about having to own furniture but we're more we demand that that is an attraction to us in those public places there's a huge opportunity for you know many people in the industry to 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 to, to sell their wares but to create more interesting pieces I think that's a super point uh, on the civic front. I do want to move on to skills, training and technology and sustainability and the clock's rapidly uh, getting away from us. But before I move on to that, uh, on the history and the sort of global influences, maybe fashion industry, has anybody any questions they'd like to ask the panel on that, on that subject? Dids McDonald. Uh, sorry. Uh, Dids McDonald, Master of the Furniture Makers. Um, you've talked a couple of times about that we're understated and that's part of our DNA. I think, and you also cite the fashion industry as being, you know, really vibrant. We can also see examples in the other parts of the creative industries, um, in films, music, um, the arts, where names just slip off the tongues, therefore you've got this vibrancy. So my question to the panel is, how do you think we can be a little bit more overstated about our fantastic design sector? Who would like to go first on that one? Helen's got the microphone. You better go. I better go. Okay, I'll <laughs> say something and then I'll hand over the microphone. Yeah. I think we just need to... I think the talent is there. I think there's a desire for people to know who's made their furniture, just like you want to know where your where your where your vegetables come from or where your beef comes from when you're when you're shopping and okay that's short term food is pretty essential we want to know where our food comes from i think people are dying to know more about what's where where you know the products they sit on come from and i think there's such a drive for wellness and st sustainability it's a perfect right time to turn around and go here is a beautiful made piece of furniture and and we've just been down to mark in the west country to spend 
specify some tremendous furniture for um, BBC Wales. Uh, and in BBC Wales, we also had a, our commission was to make sure we bought British and Welsh. So we actually went into the, the food chain, literally, to uh, manufacture Welsh sheep. <laughs> uh, we, we now no longer in Wales actually produce sheep for wool, we just eat it as la lambs. So we basically turned around and in the supply chain, and we were very lucky we had a client who demanded us to be British and support British creativity beyond just what we were specifying immediately. So we got manufacturers, Melita Gwint, to, um, to, to go to their suppliers to get Welsh sheep reintroduced to make wool, to make the, uh, the acoustic panels and, and the ceilings and the furniture of that project. And we work with people like Mark, who are in the West Country, who were also very much British. And the client wanted British. They, they needed to say, promote the fact that they were wanting British product, but they also needed to tell the audience of, of people in Wales that, uh, about that British product too. So I think we just need to get those stories out because the talent's there and just do it. Okay. Anyone else? Yep. Can I add to that? I think that it's a really interesting question. It, and um, one, I could have asked myself why um, there isn't a ma the mainstream public engagement with where this table comes from in the same way as there would be a mainstream public engagement where um, Tom's genes come from. And I think there's, there's, there's a fundamental difference in the way that people approach those two product categories and the way that they are covered in um, the press and the way that generally um, how they're regarded as being media worthy or not, as the case may be. And I think in England, we have been very slow to catch up with the story ab about furniture, about why furniture design is interesting, um, to understand the designers, to understand the motivation, in the same way as, in the same way as we do understand why we think Paul Smith is interesting, or we think Stella McCartney is interesting, or we think that um, Christopher Bailey is interesting at, at, at Burberry. We don't have, the same, as, a, as a country, in my view, the same relationship with the furniture design and the furniture designers as we do with the fashion design and the fashion designers. And I think that this is part of an educational process. Somehow, it needs to be started, whereby we need to appreciate better what we're sitting on, sleeping on, sitting at, and dining from. Um, and I think that's all part of the overall story that somehow it's a, it's, a, it's a slow grow because we came to this process late of contemporary design. We were still buying Regency dining tables 30 years ago and inheriting those from our parents, whereas, and suddenly we've gone through the whole of the kind of revolution of contemporary design in, in 30 years where other countries have been, have, have had a much kind of broader and slower and more in-depth approach to this, I think. Did you want to add another thing, Tom, or should we move, move on? Okay, yeah, because the clock is... Uh, I'd like to move us on to skills, training, and technology. I um, mean, I think everybody... It's topical at the moment, given Brexit and some of the potential barriers to the skills migration. Um, so the question is, um, how important has immigration historically been to the British design industry, and, and what role does immigration have in the industry today and, and into the future, uh, both in terms of employees and, and, and influences? Mm. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a couple of thoughts on that. I think we've always been, I think we, we should be, we're wonderfully privi privileged, it's certainly in London, but also in the UK, to have such a rich uh, and diverse culture of people from around the world. And that is a part of a reflection of our 200 years of history uh, for right or wrong in our sort of colonial period. And But also I think we are, especially this city, I think we're, there's a there's a there's a an incredible uh, acceptance and celebration of of the diversity. In our studio of 20 people, we have, I think, 13 uh, nationalities, and it's not we it's not that we go particularly looking for those, but the uh, people are drawn to this city and to this country to work, and as a result, they they feed and they they empower the process, and I think our, our Britishness is also our multi nationalism and multiculturalism and I think uh, we should stand up for it at every every moment good thank you Tom 
Helen, would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, I mean, we've got, out of 380 staff, we've got um, uh, probably about 46% are international. And, and it's only recently we've had to calculate this. We didn't think about it before, that horrible word B. Um, but uh, we also have 36 different languages in our, in, in, in our office. And it's, it's, it's just normal. That is normal for us in, Lon in London particularly. And um, I think we, we, love, we know, absolutely embrace that as, as normal. Um, and I think, you know, there, there is something, I mean, there is something particular, I think, about London being an in, in, in international centre. But long may that always be normal because you do get the diversity and the open mind and the liberalism that, that comes from that. So in some ways, we do have a quintessentially quirky relationship with sort of, um, I don't know, um, ro romantic enlightenment, Britain with, with, with Georgian furniture, etc. But I think more than ever, we, we look outwards and we, we have a contemporary, broader outlook and again I think we are, we are understating ourselves again because you know it used to be France was a wonderful place for food for French food but now you can probably get as good French food in London and others but our multiculturalism is us and and we should we should enjoy that in our in our skill set and design is no is no uh, um, is, is, is also where we should design it we um, enjoy it and I've heard you talk about ripples in the pool in that yeah. context I mean, is that something you feel speaks to this as well. I think ripples in pools, absolutely. Um, I mean, when we're talking about some of the subjects that, are, that, has, that, that have socio-economic interest to people, you know, well building, I mean, uh, you know, we're lucky enough to work with a client recently who's got 13,000 people in their portfolio and w um, they were keen to achieve a well building. It's the first well building gold in the world now, well is accredited for the good of every peop of people, health of people. Um, there is a little bit of tick box that goes with it, but it still is for the benefit of all of you as individuals to make you healthier in an office building. And it, it's, it's designed and came from America. The gold was won in London. Now, you know, I feel superbly proud to have had a team that have helped to make that happen well isn't going away because now we are much more able to, to demand um, you know, better quality workplaces, better quality designed, design environments, somewhere where we feel good. I mean, the other, the, the other ripple comes from, um, you know, uh, in, in that well design, I now go out and look for product that ticks the box of well. So um, I can turn around, and even if you're not going for that gold, you can, uh, as for this piece of furniture here, you know, this was um, a lot of R&D was spent on, on creating a sort of well product that doesn't emit horrible um, chemicals that you breathe in that doesn't, you know, that isn't good for you. That is where the world is going. So, um, and that's happening here in, in, in Britain and London, and, and let's do more of it. Do any of you have any specific comments on the broad concern that, uh, you know, the government's fixation, possibly well-intentioned with STEM subjects, and the demise of many of the courses in the tertiary educational establishment for, and, and also in schools for design and technology is having an impact on the likely supply chain of, of skills that the industry needs? I think it's, a, I think it's a, a total tragedy, honestly. I think that there's two things that have gone wrong. I think the, we've, we've effectively privatized tertiary education to the point that uh, universities are bound to go and export that, that skill set, which is why you now have 130 people on the first year of a, of a design school course where it's impossible to learn because there's no workshops facilities. And I think the... The, the stripping out of arts, the liberal arts side of the creative industries education at secondary level is, ha is already having an impact in the flow of the right quality uh, and, and mass of, of the creative industry professionals coming out. I think it's, it's the most short-sighted bit of policy in the last decade, apart from a few others. Uh, so any suggestions as to how we better engage? How do you find your interns? I mean, how do you f do you find that these are as good as they as they used to be? Well, our, our view on interns has changed over the years because we used to look for people with um, good skills. Now we look for people with good attitudes. Um, so it's not quite the same. We used to think that if you could use 
uh, a bit of CAD software, it was really useful. Now we want people who are passionate. And actually the passionate people, sort of almost by force of their nature, end up at your door. So we, we, our filtering process has changed over 20 years of experience of realizing what, what, people, what the people who add value. And it's, it's a strange flip because actually people who are passionate and curious are, tends to be the ones who create the, uh, the, the most skills at the end of the day anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no, I'm with you on that. I think, sorry. No, 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 okay. um, the, the thing which um, I think is terrible and Tom referred to is just is the, uh, the, f the um, lack of training that students get in making anymore. And um, I, it, it's, I think it's a, such a fundamental part of the design process that you need to understand how things are made and if you, understand, if you put a joint together yourself or if you've laminated a table or you've actually tried to create a chair or whatever it is in real life and you have a few skills, it makes it so much more relevant when you try and design that same product. And um, it, we've noticed over the years that the people who have come to, to want to work with us in the studio, their making skills have become much less um, useful and much less good. And um, so yeah, I think that's the biggest, the biggest thing that we have really found is it's such a shame the workshops have gone from the, from the educational places. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's not as if we're not telling government the value of the creative industries to the economy. I mean, it's, it's 85 billion uh, up to GDP, the creative industries more broadly, and the furniture industry is, is, as well, 18 billion of contribution to GDP. So we're not small industries. That isn't commonly known by government, and we're doing what we can. But I was just wondering whether you had any particular ideas of how to make our industry more appealing. As, as those students in the more broad design disciplines are making choices, um, it's not always furniture that they would choose. We were talking about fashion earlier on. If you go to the RCA and you're wandering the halls, you know, it's quite a, a broad church of disciplines. Um, I, I didn't get the impression that furniture was necessarily their first choice. And obviously designing a chair but is a tough one. Then, well, but, yeah. I mean, when I was at the RCA again, retrospectively, um, the, some of the most cool things were certainly not what I was studying as a subject, which was architecture, because we had no product and at that point in time, people who made stuff, you know, whether it was fine art, sculpture, or um, you know, furniture, you know, they had really sexy, lovely product to produce. Our problem was we had black and white drawings on tracing paper that crinkled, that looked really dull, that you had to think hard for. It was really hard to actually compete. You know, ironically, you know, we're now in a situation where you can sort of, you can be closer to the making of stuff. But I think, um, I do think that there's, um, it has become a bit, um, you know, it's fine if you can afford to go to the RCA to do your MA and get that, um, get that wonderful connection to making stuff. Um, I do think the education for um, making making stuff has been very much neglected. We've tried with some of our clients to get makers and, and students to help create designs that we then build. A few years ago in the Manchester area, we managed it and we got some students on their modules to design stuff that we then were able to introduce them to business to get stuff made. The, 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 create, the, the, the industry was delighted because they got more interesting sort of um, uh, ideas that, that sold because it was really, they, they were useful design solutions. But when we have just more recently tried to do the same exercise, we didn't get anything that was worthwhile. And I think the reason we didn't was we got some lax drawings that were slightly digital, but we just did not have people who loved making things. And I think that, that joy and respect of craft is something that we, have, um, we, we aren't currently valuing because we've shifted to more of a digital focus. I think there has to be a swing back to um, absolutely enjoying making because I think the audience, I think there are people who are there who want to buy things that are made, that are beautiful. I just think we need to make it more accessible. And that's not necessarily price. I think we need to go and tell those stories and, and get people to demand um, you know, better quality, more interesting stuff that's made because I think human beings like touching beautiful things. Uh, unfortunately, I think there's a huge contradiction here, which is around craft and making and elitism, because the cost of the cost of our, our um, the cost of living 
represents a, a major barrier in how much time you can spend on a product and make it available to a wide audience. And we, we are trained, we, we develop products where we time the assembly down to two and a half minutes in order to make it affordable. Now that, you might say that strips the craft right out of the making process, but it's the only way of bringing the manufacturing back into this country. Because in, in any Western European country, you can't, the reason we have things made in Hungary or Slovenia or Lithuania is because the labor costs are a third of what they are here. So you, if you want to sell someone a chair for 200 pounds, which most people think is extortionate because they can spend four pounds in Ikea, 200 pounds is an incredibly cheap price for a wooden chair, but it, you have to have it made in Eastern Europe in order to get to that price. So there's a, we, we, we can't, we can't conflate all the issues at the same time. Craft is a wonderful thing, but the, the cost of production in any, any Western country it simply denies the, the, the accessibility. Mm. Just but there is also, there is also the, uh, the fact that you, um, the awareness for throwaway yep. IKEA is changing. Yep. So yes, that means everybody can go and buy a wardrobe from IKEA and they can, and it's affordable, which is important to have. But equally, I think there's an interest in if you just if you think about the market as not just being personal and domestic, but you think about of it course. being society, then you know actually buying product mm -hmm. that's going to last is more sustainable. Yep. And I think there's 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 such a, an important socio-economic um, drive for that. Actually, what we need to do is go and say, look, go and buy something that's going to last you 20 years because of the carbon embodied um, um, sort of uh, energy, effect yeah. of that. Because you're not wasting so much energy, mm -hmm. not throw away IKEA all the time. Totally. But it, but I th I think you need to think beyond just the domestic market in order to kind of go and tell people why to to buy something that's going to last them longer. Just one, one other point, just going back to the education thing. I think, I mean, this may be anecdotal, but every, the creative industries may be the last one that gets hit by artificial intelligence. So I think there's something we should really celebrate. It's is, is the last, the imagination is the last thing that's going to be killed by, by AI. And so we should all be encouraging people to go into the creative industries because it's the most long-lasting job you can have in 30 years when s lawyers accountants and engineers have all been replaced by computing th the people who are creating things will be the ones who are still in work i i, I hear the lament from many th of students that they don't quite know where to start when they're coming through there doesn't appear to be careers advice anymore or anything like that there are things that the delivery company and, and, and others behind the design guild models are trying to do to introduce uh, Students to you know in partnerships to to, man, to to prospective employers. Is there anything you feel that we could be doing more as an industry to to encourage people when they're making those choices, often earlier than we often imagine, about careers and where to go in creative industries? Thank you. Um, the I, uh, the um, I think it's really tricky that I don't know how many people here have recently come out of university or recently come out of college you've studied design but whether they f whether they feel that they have got a genuine opportunity of designing the sort of things they want to design for the sort of companies that they want to design for and I suspect that very few of you will believe that that's what you're going to be doing in 10 years time as opposed to be in a technical department of a brand or with a R&D department of a manufacturing company or in academia or whatever, very few of you, I suspect, will end up doing what you really thought you were wanted to be doing when you started your course. And it comes back, I know I'm, I'm sounding like a broken record, but it comes back, I think, to this idea that we do not have enough of the small to medium-sized um, brands that people can then can graduate into having done their designer making, having done their individual workshop, workshop work or whatever it is. Um, because um, there isn't that there isn't that hinterland, I think, in the in the UK that we have. Um, and I was just I was reading an interview with Pierre Lassoni, who, who you will hear of, and he was talking about um, how important it is for him um, to be part of and support the Italian furni furniture industry. How, how that whole thing is within his DNA and within the area of Brianza, which is just outside Milan, there are 20,000 furniture-related companies in one little district. And this is like 
an extraordinarily intricate and well-developed and um, sophisticated network of suppliers and specialist manufacturers that, again, we have lost. So that whole kind of, um, that whole relationship that we have as a country, going back to our big question, which is what British design is, between, I think, the, the design and the manufacturing to a certain extent is we've sort of lost that. And I think that um, that's part of the reason why I think that a lot of university people are struggling with how they design those courses. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping I can be indulged. I got the signal that we're, we're, we're out of time, but I'm going to call for three extra minutes anyway because we were a bit late starting. So I'd like to throw it open to you. I've not left you very much time for questions, but could you uh, quickly address any questions you may have? The lady there in the black jacket. I've been in higher education for 20-odd years, and I do honestly feel it's not fit for purpose anymore. And I've been involved with business development in universities. And what a lot of uh, organizations are saying to me is that actually you're cloning students now. They're all coming out. They're looking and sounding alike. And a lot of the companies are targeting the younger people. And I think maybe this is possibly what you need to do. You have to, I agree with Tom when he said recruit for attitude and train for skills. I think having the right attitude is absolutely crucial. And there's a lot of youngsters coming through in schools that would be your ideal ambassadors of the future. They are so enthusiastic, so keen, they want to learn, and they'll come up possibly with innovative ideas for you. Nobody is actually telling them in a university, this is the way you should do it. They have lots of ideas of their own. And maybe, possibly, that is where you should go in the future. Because people buy people, and it sounds as if you want some young ambassadors. I'll also say, I've travelled around the world a lot, and I always buy my furniture from the UK. And the key reason why I buy furniture from the UK is because it's the quality. And there are an awful lot of organisations, businesses, globally, that would love to market your products or our British products. And I think we've got a little bit incestuous with Europe and we're not looking outside at the bigger markets. So a couple of ideas maybe yeah. for you. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I'll ask a quick question back if I may. You talk about an industry engaging with, uh, with, with universities or, and, and even earlier, a, a younger, young children. What is the catalyst for that? How, how does one create the opportunity for, 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 to influence them? Are there open house days that the industry needs to engage with? You have to target the schools yourself. Target the youngsters in whatever way you can. But make it sexy, make it different. Uh, and you've got to use social media to do it as well. So you've got to sort of meet the youngsters at their level more. Uh, did you want Actually, to comment, yeah. I, Just as an anecdote, I was, um, I was at a, a meal with a, a, a group of designers recently and, and a 28-year-old designer said she, the only research she does for her, she's a Gensler in America, the only, only, only research she does for buying furniture is Instagram. Yes, um, yeah, literally, it's true. She, 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 if, mm. if, a, if a brand is not engaging with her yeah. on her Instagram feed, she would never ever think about going to a website. Yeah. Well, the reason so I brand. came um, along we to do this... Need, we do need to... W yeah. No, it's absolutely, it's not depressing at all. I think it's, it's, I think it's very relevant. The reason I came here actually was interest for my godson because he's had no formal training at all and he loves wood and he started to design his own furniture and he's only been really doing it for a couple of years and he's actually just got his very first uh, proposal, if you like, or project with a, a footballer from Norwich who wants to, to give him 10 or 15,000 pounds to develop a bar for him in his 3.5 million pound house. Uh, and it was to really sort of get ideas for him as to how he gets out there. So that's, that's why I've come here really today. <laughs> thank well, you. <laughs> thank you very much for your question. I'm sorry, I, we, we are, uh, regrettably, it's my fault for not having t opened it up to you earlier, but we are going to have to call, call, it, call it a day. So perhaps I could ask you all to thank our panel for their time and energy coming in today. And uh, I'm sure they can take a few questions from you after the session. All right, thank you.